And I want to, over the next couple of weeks, talk a little bit about the worship that we engage in as a congregation, as a body of God's people in this location. And I want to go through why we do what we do and establish a couple of things. And, and I want to begin, first of all, this morning with giving. This is a subject that I think most preachers really don't like to talk about for a few reasons. One, because of the religious world around us has, uh, be, has gained a reputation for uh, you know, being churches that just desire and want money. They just want you to give and give more and it's all about the money. And, and for a lot of the religious world, it seems that that has been true. And we don't want to convey that thought or that idea. But nevertheless, this is a Bible subject, a Bible topic, and something that we are to do upon the first day of the week, as we will notice in the lesson this morning. And so it is something that is important that we understand why we do it, how we do it. And I want to also answer a few questions. And so very quickly, the four points for this morning's lesson. First of all, number one is giving is, in fact, worship. Number two, churches, even in the scriptures, had means to accomplish the work that God had given them to do. There is a motivation for us to engage in giving. And I want to answer the question, at, finally, of whether or not 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, apply for us today. And we'll get into why I, I phrase it that way, because you'd be surprised, perhaps, to learn that there is a push to dismiss 1 Corinthians 16 and say that that, that doesn't apply for us anymore today. And so we'll, we'll look at that in this morning's lesson. First of all, let's understand that giving is, in fact, worship. Even in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 in Acts chapter 2, the very beginning of the church on that day of Pentecost, when Peter and the other apostles were preaching the, uh, the gospel of Christ to the Jews who were there uh, in Jerusalem on that day, and 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel, we learn in verse 42 that they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And I would suggest to you that in that particular text, we have four acts of worship that we engage in even today. Many of you would look at that and, and think, oh, well, obviously we have preaching, we have the Lord's Supper, and we have prayers. But where does fellowship fall into that? The idea of fellowship is one that can be confusing and probably needs to have its own uh, you know, lesson or series of lessons to talk about what fellowship is truly is, but let me just simply put it this way. The word fellowship is translated in our English Bibles various ways throughout the New Testament, from 1 Corinthians to Romans to the book of Acts. It, it, it is the word uh, koinonia or koinonio, meaning having in common, sharing in common. It's translated contribution participation and so it isn't just merely uh, a having in common a common faith but it is used in reference to the contribution and giving as well and I think in context for Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 that would certainly fit the idea and as we see going through verse 46 as they were having all things in common and sharing with one another and providing to one another the, the needs that, were, uh, that they had in Jerusalem at that particular time. And we learn in the next few chapters that they would come and they would lay their gifts at the apostles' feet as the church was growing there in Jerusalem. So we know that they were engaged in this activity. But let's go back to the Old Testament to help understand a little bit more about the thought and the idea of giving itself being worship. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9, Proverbs chapter 3 
in verse 9, we are told to honor the Lord with your substance. Honor the Lord with your substance and the first fruits of all your increase. I want you to notice just exactly how this points out that what we do with our increase is honoring God. It is showing honor, giving honor and glory. It is worshiping God and doing so with our sub substance, doing so with the, the first fruits of our increase, with our possessions. And we do that by giving back to the Lord. In Exodus chapter 35, in verse 5, this is where Moses was told by God to command the people to, to give a free will offering so that they could make all the things that were necessary for the tabernacle. But the idea, I want you to notice exactly how it is worded in this text. It says, take up an offering to the Lord. What is it? What, think about that for just a minute. What, what's the point being made? The offering is to create this tabernacle for the, a dwelling place of God, this tent of meeting. And here Moses is telling them and instructing them and writing by inspiration of God that they are to make an offering to the Lord. He goes on to say, whoever has a willing heart let him bring an offering to the Lord. And so with this offering that is being made is one that is, in fact, to the Lord. In the book of Leviticus, beginning in chapter 1, he, he begins by talking about the offerings, by talking about the, the, the giving and the sacrifices that would be made all in worship to God, Leviticus 1. And in verse 3, talking about a free will offering for or to the temple. In chapter 1 and verse 10, he talks about what is to be offered. The herds and the flocks that are without blemish. When you go to chapter 2 and verse 11, he talks about the grain offerings. But not just any grain offerings. The grain offerings must be of the first fruits. And so we see that there was an offering that was being made. And it was being made and offered to God. In Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy 14 verses 22 and 23. Again, here he talks about a tithe. And what a tithe does. A tithe teaches Fear. Think, fear of what? But what is this fear or respect that it is teaching? It is a respect and a fear for God. And so this tithe, this offering that was to be made, was to focus their attention on God and acknowledging God. Certainly, I think we should, could understand that the point and the idea is that they were involved in worshiping God through their offering, through their giving. In Deuteronomy 15, in Deuteronomy 15, verse 11, if you look at what is said, he points out here, open your hand wide to the needy and supply the needs of the Levites and the fatherless. And you look at that and you think, okay, well, how is that worshiping God, helping out those who are in need and, and providing for the priests and providing for the fatherless? When you go to Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 17, Proverbs 19 and in verse 17, it says there that he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he, that is the Lord, will pay back. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. Again, notice who the true uh, focus is upon. 
It is upon God. It is honoring and glorifying God. And even coming back to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter, in, in 2 Corinthians in chapter 8, in verse 4 and 5, talking about the Macedonians who were begging that they could participate in the giving and, and offering and helping for those who were struggling in the famine taking place in Jerusalem, yeah. says that they gave themselves first to God. In their giving, in their offering, to do what they were willing to do, they gave themselves first to God. This was to glorify and to honor God. It was in an act of worship. While it benefited others, it was an act of worshiping, honoring, showing value and understanding of where these things came from, that they came from God. So yes, indeed, our giving is an act of worship. And that is something that we must not dismiss or take lightly, just as with any other act of worship that we engage in. Secondly, I want to point out that churches had means. It was obvious that not only they were that they uh, that giving was worship, that they were participating in taking up a collection and having an offering that they were giving but we see that that was being used for certain works that the church had means to carry out various works that God had commanded those churches to engage in evangelism for example in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 8 in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 8, as Paul writes to the Corinthians, and he explains to them about receiving pay, he says, I robbed other churches taking wages. You see, they were making certain accusations against Paul. And Paul is pointing out, listen, I didn't want to take anything from you. Because I didn't want you to, to make accusations that I was doing this for the money. That, that this was all about me and trying to get rich off of you. That's not what this is about. And so he, he's making the point, I robbed other churches so that that would not be an issue. That this was not about that with you and your salvation and your souls. In the book of Philippians, we see that there, one of the churches that Paul received money from Philippians chapter 4 in verse 15 in Philippians chapter 4 in verse 15 he says no other church shared with me concerning giving but only you at one point in time the church at Philippi was the church that was supporting Paul they were sending money to him and he writes to them and giving them and thanking them for that. Obviously, the church had means to do that. But let's go back to Corinth for a minute. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, as Paul begins, and really the context is 1 through 14, as far as verses are concerned, and he writes to them and he's pointing out and saying, Listen, you know, I'm an apostle like all the others, and I have the right to do just as the other apostles have done. To have wages, to, to take a, a believing wife, to all these things that he points out. And then he, he, he talks about how he also, he and Barnabas, he's like, what, what's the difference between us? Why is it that we should be the only ones that have to be tent makers, that have to work? And his point is that churches, the church in Corinth particularly, you know, through their means, would be and should be willing and able to support the preaching of the gospel. To pay those who would be providing for and helping them as far as the, the, the work of an evangelist is concerned. But that isn't the only work that they were involved in. There was the work of benevolence. And we can spend a lot of time on this particular work, but we're just going to look at a couple of passages and something we can look at and dive into more detail at another time. But Acts chapter 11, for example. Acts 11, verse 29 through 30. As we see here that the church in Antioch was sending funds and relief to 
the saints in Jerusalem. They were involved in the work of benevolence with the means that they had. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, beginning, he points out, now concerning the collection for the saints. And so there was a, a work of benevolence that was being done. And of course, we're going to look more detailed in a moment at 2 Corinthians in chapters 8 and 9. But before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about the motives in our giving. What is it that motivates us? What is it that, 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 that causes us to, in our consideration for our giving? Because God hasn't left us to simply, you know, just, just guess and wonder about our motivation for this. He actually talks about it. First Chronicles. Going back in the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles chapter 29. In verse 14, beginning, he says that all things come from you and of your own. We have given you. All things come from you and of your own. We give to the Lord. We are giving back what He has blessed us with. We are giving back what He has given to us. What is His? He is the creator and sustainer of this world. He is the potter. We are the clay. All things are from Him. All things that are made are made from Him. Nothing was made without Him. And so we understand and know that when we give back, we are merely giving back what is His to be. In Acts chapter 20, in verse 35, in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, he says that it is more blessed to give than to receive. So often we, we feel that sense of blessing when we give. And, and, it is, and, and just proving that passage to be more true in our lives than ever every time we give, realizing how blessed it is to be able to help, to participate, to glorify God, and to give back as we have been prospered. 2 Corinthians in chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, he says there that the Lord, there towards the end of that verse, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. For the love of God, we give knowing that he loves a cheerful giver, that we are glad and joyful for what we are able to give back. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, Philippians chapter 4 in verse 15, or rather verse 17. In Philippians chapter 4 there in verse 17, Remember verse 15, he already said that, that they were the only ones that were participating with him at one point as far as giving was concerned. And he talked to them about how, how wonderful it is and how he's so thankful to them for what they gave and how it will be repaid to them. And I think the point that he is making in verse 17 is about their stewardship and what they were doing with the means that they had. And being good stewards of what they were blessed with. And using it to glorify God and to further the gospel of Christ. I think that point is being made in Philippians 4 and verse 17. 1 Corinthians though. Going back to chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. When you look at verse 3. He talks a little bit about our motivation of why we give. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 3. He says as you have prospered. Let each one of you lay by in store as you have prospered. Recognizing that we have prospered. Recognizing that what we have prospered is from God. We desire to give back to <laughs> him. And so that motivates us to do that very thing. Even back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 16 and verse 17. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 17, he says, Give as you are able. As you are able. Desiring to give what we can. 
over and over again. We, we can look at so many other passages. We're going to come back to 2 Corinthians, though, because I want us to notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, where he says, He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. In verse 7, as you purpose in your heart, not grudgingly or by necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. What we give is to be given out of a desire and a joy to be able to give. What we have predetermined and what, out of what we are able to to give. And talking about various gifts that people had in Romans 12 and verse 8. Those who give, giving bountifully. Those who are able to give, to give in abundance and bountifully. But for those who are able, those who have determined and purposed in their own heart, this is what he desires for them. What he wants of them. Just as the Macedonians had that desire in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, again, over and over, verses 1 through 5, according to their ability and beyond. It's as though they went into debt in order to be able to give. But I also want to point out that as Paul goes through 2 Corinthians chapter 8, talking about the Macedonians and what they gave and how they gave, and giving themselves first to the Lord. They were begging. They were pleading with, with Paul and the others. that Let us participate in this. Let us help those in Macedonia. Or rather from Macedonia. Those in Jerusalem. Let us give to this cause. They wanted to help the brethren who were in need and suffering back in Jerusalem. And they were begging Paul to let them participate. They were not begging to let them give or take up a collection, but rather they were begging to let them participate in that particular work. And then Paul goes on and points out in verses 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and their abundance and how they gave, he goes, but then, you know, I'm not commanding you, Corinthians, you know, in all of this. And that's a key in going into our next point that I want to talk about. Because Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 8, in verse 8 through 11, talks about how, it, what, I, I'm not commanding you concerning the giving for Jerusalem and how much you are to give. Now think about that for just a minute. Because what we have in, in our last point one of our last points we're going to talk about is the idea of whether or not 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 through 3 applies to us today. And there is a growing push, it would seem, in fact, this is two weeks ago or this past week, someone contacted uh, the, the Green Spirits program and pointed out that they were in disagreement with an idea that 1 Corinthians 16 is something that is commanded for us today, that that, that was only and I will repeat, only for a specific need in Jerusalem at the time, therefore not for us today. And that seems to be a growing sentiment. And I want to, I want to examine this for a minute because I've looked at that and wondered, is, first of all, is that true? And secondly, you know, I, I don't understand the point really why what they're trying to do other than many are trying to say we don't have to take up a collection on the first day of the week. It's not something that we need to do or we're not commanded to do. Now, so let's examine this text for just a minute. First of all, yes, there was a specific need in Jerusalem. And he begins in verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints. All right, so, so yes, there is a need under consideration, but let me ask you this. Do you believe that's the only need under consideration and only work under consideration in 1 Corinthians 16? 
And I will show you in context that the answer to that question is no. First of all, the command, he says, as I give orders to the church of the Galatians, so you do also. Upon the first day of every week, each of you lay by in store as you have prospered. Then he goes on to say, so that there be no collection when I come. Now, he didn't say, so there's no collection you know, until I come, but rather when I come. That's going to be significant when we go back over to 2 Corinthians in just a moment. But before we do that, I want us to, to point out more of the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Because there's a little bit more said, and he doesn't stop just in verse 3. If you go down to verse 6, as Paul is writing to them, in the same context, he says there that I hope and desire is to come to them and to meet with them and to be with them. And he says, and that you would help me. So Paul, in this context, is saying that from the collection that you take, while it's some that you determine, as we'll notice in a moment, will be used for the need in Jerusalem and for the needy saints. Also, I want you to help me along my way. But then go down to verse 11. Somebody's going to come to them first. And that's Timothy. Timothy is going to come first. And what does he tell them to do with Timothy? I want you to help him as well. In the same context of the situation going on in the, the famine taking place in Jerusalem, the need of the saints in Jerusalem, there was more to be done than just that work. They were helping Paul, and they were to help Timothy as well. And so it makes sense when Paul then, in chapter uh, 2 Corinthians 8, verses 8 through 11, talks about how that it's not a command how much you give and that you go beyond and so much like the Macedonians. I'm not making this command about, uh, about that, about the offering to Jerusalem. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 5, as he talks about going and receiving their gift. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, he says, I thought that it would be good. I thought it necessary to, to urge uh, the, the, the brethren to go ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be received as a willing gift, not as an exaction. Think about that. Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians and talking about this gift concerning the collection for the saints. While they were to, as a command, give upon the first day of every week as they have prospered. But they had promised a gift to Jerusalem, and it was not an exaction. It was a willing gift that they were going to send to them through the hand of Paul and others. In verse 12, in verse 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, Not only supplying the needs of the saints, but others as well. And it is an over, it is overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So it was much more than just what was taking place in Jerusalem. Much more than just benevolence for the needy saints at that particular time. A lot of things were taking place. And churches had means as they were laying things at the apostles' feet in the book of Acts chapter 5 and chapter 6 as, as the church had means to distribute to those who were in need. We see that there was a 
a command given that as we have prospered on the first day of every week to, to take up a collection. And, and it is worship to God. With that said, I want to leave you with a final thought, and that is from our scripture reading, Mark chapter 12 and verses 41 through 44. And this is to show you just how much God thinks about this. And to show you that this isn't just something that we do as a, a matter of bookkeeping. It's just not to pay the bills. It's just not to pay the preacher, not to keep the lights on. No, it's, that, that's not, it's something that we do just kind of have hardly well. You know, it takes money to run a business and, and church is kind of like a business. So we just kind of do this and, and we have to do it to be able to sustain. Sec, er, Mark chapter 12, verse 41, when Jesus was at the temple. It says that he sat opposite of the treasury and he watched. In the same manner, I believe Jesus and our Heavenly Father is watching us today in what we do with what we have and how we give. He points out that there were those who were giving of their abundance. They were giving a ton of money. They were putting in a lot of things out of their abundance. And people would look and go, wow. They're giving. And there was this widow who gave this, what we would probably refer to a piddly little amount, two mites. And Jesus says she gave of her livelihood. And because she gave of her livelihood, just not out of her abundance, she was truly making a sacrifice. She gave more than everyone else because it was from her livelihood and not from her abundance. He wasn't condemning those, giving of their abundance. He was just pointing out truly where this widow's heart was. But I think the biggest point is the fact that he was just watching. That he was paying attention. He was interested. And we should think no less today. He is watching. He knows what we give. And he knows why we give from our hearts. And he knows our approach in our worship, in our giving, and he knows how we use those funds. And whether or not we're looking for authority or we're just simply doing what we think or, or feel like is right or wrong. And so as we go through these lessons, understand this. When we worship God in spirit and in truth, even in our giving, it matters to God. We must do it with the right heart, with the right authority, and we must understand that authority and how we give, why we give, if we're truly going to worship in spirit and truth, which God is seeking those to worship him that way. If you're here this morning and you desire to serve God, you desire to, to please him and to do things his way, first and foremost, you must become a child of God. You must turn from your sins, realizing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. And Jesus says that the way to Him is to be born again of water and the Spirit. And He explained that in Mark 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. If you will repent of your sins, believing Jesus died on the cross, shedding His blood, so that you could have a means of salvation... You can contact that blood that he shed by repenting of your sins, dying to the old man of sin of this world, and burying him in a watery grave of baptism, just as Jesus died and was buried. Jesus rose from the dead. You, through faith in the power of the operation of God, can rise from a watery grave to walk in a newness of life. The blood of Christ washing away your sins, and you rising a new creature, a child of God, glorifying and honoring him with your life, with everything you do and with everything you say. If a child, of, if as a child of God you fall short and you need to repent and pray, do so. He's faithful and just. He'll forgive you. He desires nothing more than your salvation and to be for you to be with him eternally in heaven. We'll be happy to pray with you as well. If you have a need to make your life right, please don't delay. Come to the front, let it be made known as together we stand and sing.